Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to get started because we are at 12.30. Uh, I hope you and your families are well. And if you're watching live, happy Friday and congratulations. We made it through another week. My name is Katie Jacobs. I work with HR leaders at the CIPD and I've been hosting the CIPD's coronavirus webinar series. Today, we're going to be discussing how HR teams can best look after those workers who can't work at home because they're classed as essential. And joining me today, I've got a really brilliant panel. If we could just get the slide with their names on, please. Uh, first up, Rachel Suff, Senior Employment Relations Advisor at the CIPD, where she leads on all things health and wellbeing. Dr. Andrew Sharman, President of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. Stuart Branch, Group People and IT Director at Weetabix. Dr. Tracy Leghorn, Chief HR and Health and Safety Officer at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK, and Andrew Willis, Head of Legal and Advisory at HR Inform, the CIPD's employment law resource, uh, as ever reliably on hand to provide our answers to any particularly tricky legal questions. First up, I'm just gonna run through some quick housekeeping. This session is being recorded. It will be available on demand. You can find it on the webinar section of the CIPD website. There you can also access recordings of our previous webinars on topics such as health and wellbeing for remote workers and several on furlough and sign up for future sessions. At the moment, we're running two a week. Next week, we've got one on leadership and communications during crisis and one on how HR teams can look after themselves. And I'll remind you again about those at the end of the session. Uh, questions. If you want to submit questions at the webinar, during the webinar, please could you use the Q&A tab, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen please don't use the chat box because we're not going to be monitoring it very closely. Attendees are all muted, so you're going to need to type your questions. You can't ask, ask them verbally. The slides will be available to download, and we do have quite a lot of slides with a lot of information, but don't worry, you will be able to access them this afternoon. And finally, for legal advice, just a reminder that CIPD members can call our HR Inform helpline. It's available 24-7, and you will get an individual response. And we're updating the FAQs and resources on our website all the time because new information is becoming available all the time. Head to the CIPD Coronavirus Hub for more. So let's get going with the topic. While many of us are lucky enough to be working from home, an army of essential key workers are keeping the UK fed, watered and safe. They're traveling to workplaces, they're working on sites, and you'll find them in all sorts of sectors, from healthcare to food production, utilities, food delivery, retail. How can HR teams best support the health and well-being of those providing essential services, as well as keeping these people feeling engaged? And given the increased health and safety requirements that we're gonna see once things start to return to some semblance of normality, there's a lot we can learn from organizations who have spent weeks working out how to keep key workers safe. So that's what we're gonna be considering this afternoon with insight and case studies from our guests as well as opportunities for you to ask questions. We've had a few submitted in advance, but please do submit them via the Q&A at the bottom as well. Our running order, first up, Rachel's gonna set some context. She's gonna talk about the importance of protecting people's physical and mental health while at work. Then Andrew will offer some insight into managing workplace safety, health and wellbeing. Stuart and Tracy will then give case studies and then we'll take questions. And the other Andrew will be on hand in case any of those questions have a legal an angle. So I'm gonna hand over to Rachel now, who's gonna set some context. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, first slide. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We know that you as HR professionals are at the forefront of your organization in guiding its response to the pandemic. And as such, you're under enormous pressure to translate the stringent public health requirements, what they mean in practice for your essential or key workers to help uh, prevent the spread of infection. And that could be in a very wide range of different workplace settings, different occupations, roles, and so on, as this slide shows. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview from a people management perspective um, as to what has brought us to this point now. And, and ahead of the school closures, there was a lot of discussion and confusion as well about which sectors and which workers should be classed as key workers and be expected to carry on attending work in a physical sense. Government did publish a list of sectors. It was published uh, in the form of uh, guidance for schools and other educational settings 
because of course it is those workers who can still carry on sending their children to school. Now it's a very broad list and I'm sure a lot of you will have seen it. It covers health and social care obviously but a lot of other sectors as well. But because those cate categories are broad and I think that's intentional, it does mean that there have been some quite grey areas around who is deemed a key worker or not and it is left to the judgment of employers and employees themselves as well in, in some cases. Could I have the next slide please? Now obviously the immediate priority, keeping people safe, keeping those key workers safe from infection in a physical sense is paramount to your response as an organisation. There has been and continues to be a whole range of different important guidance from the World Health Organization, from our government, from public health bodies. So really important that every employer is aware of those uh, sources and refers to them. Now in terms of the key workers, government does say that all the key protection and hygiene measures still apply to the majority of different business settings. So in terms of regular hand washing that we know so much about now, deep clean of workplace. Also physically uh, distancing, which I think is a more uh, apt term than social distance. But those practical steps that you can take in the workplace really need to be boiled down to a granular level in terms of the kind of activities that every worker goes through as part of their job. So it's an awful lot of work um, to work that out. Um, but for example, um, other measures that um, are in the government guidance, such as trying to keep teams of workers together, like cohorting, keeping teams as small as possible, the digital transfer of documents, not paper formats. So these are some of the measures that you're going to have to think about in that real deep level of detail um, when you carry out your risk assessments and so on. Now, government has followed that more general advice on social distancing up with more detailed sector guidance on social distancing, which is helpful because it gives some more illustrative examples of the kind of measures that you can take. Also, I wanted to mention that trade bodies, sector bodies, for example, in financial services, have also produced more detailed guidance that could be helpful. So really important to refer to that as well. And I would emphasise how important it is for HR to work through this wherever possible with their health and safety and occupational health teams where you have those available. But those professional bodies have also been very good at producing really helpful guidance that it's worth referring to in terms of managing those health risks to people in the workplace. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, moving on from the physical risk, I'm sure you're all very aware that it's becoming more and more obvious now that the risks to people's health from this pandemic is not just physical, it is also mental. And the risks to people in a psychological are being warned about uh, quite strong now uh, in terms of World Health Organization advice. They know history tells us that a pandemic will increase the risk of mental ill health and even suicide amongst populations, including the workforce. And that is during and after the pandemic as well. That fear, anxiety and so on does not just disappear. So really important that every organisation has an holistic approach to how it manages risk to people's health in every sense of, of the word. And the potential risks, thinking about key workers in particular, obviously fear and anxiety, but there, there are manifold risks to, to people's mental well-being because of this pandemic. Um, key workers, yes, health and social care staff, for example, they are used to dealing with trauma, with death and so on, but never before I expect at a rate and, and a scale um, that they're experiencing at the moment. And every key worker is going to be facing new work demands and the level of pressure on people will be immense and, and for some will feel intolerable at times. In terms of people's mental health as well, it's important to remember that it's felt in a very individual sense 
it's not static, it will fluctuate, it's very hard to predict how anybody will feel on any given day, I think we've all experienced that, so it's up and down. Also influenced by many factors, inside work, yes, but also outside work, because many key workers could be facing quite challenging situations themselves at home as well. So very important for employers and managers as well at that level to understand people's individual circumstances, have those one-to-one -to -one conversations, see what support people need. Obviously be very mindful if somebody has a mental health condition as well. And then finally on this slide, I just want to mention how important it is to support your line managers, who many will feel out of their depth at the moment, who are facing um, quite challenging situations in terms of supporting and managing and motivating their key workers. So they will have an acute need for guidance. And you can find a lot of that guidance on our final slide. This is our hub around the coronavirus. And we've uh, worked really hard and we're keeping that up to date. There's lots of practical uh, tools that you can take away with you, including for managers. So please do uh, go and have a look to see what, what might help you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that um, great oversight. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Sharman to take us through the next 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Sharman, President of IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health. It's the world's largest professional body for those who work to protect and enhance the safety, health and well-being of people employed across all sectors everywhere. With over 47,000 IOSH members now constituting our networks through our branches and groups, and many pursuing their professional development in alignment with IOSH's competency framework and the training skills, mentoring, volunteering and collaboration opportunities that we provide. Right now, many of those people are hard at work supporting their colleagues, leadership teams and suppliers as they adapt to new health protection needs and behaviours during the current coronavirus. I IOSH provides four things to the market, but most people don't experience the complete picture, so I thought that might be helpful to set some context here. First, we represent the occupational safety and health profession globally. Uh, not for profit status and Royal Charter offer benefits globally too. Uh, our funds belong to the public, therefore we have to invest them wisely. And the two statuses combine to provide an extra layer of governance over and above that of typical organizations to assure the quality and integrity of our actions. Secondly, our status within the profession means that individuals choose to support us by becoming members. Collectively, they create a fantastic asset that allows us to operate in 130 countries around the world. Third, our thought leadership generates trust and respect. All of our positions are well considered and underpinned by research and evidence. And finally, as we're an enabler of organizational success worldwide, as a vocational body, our members and our products and services support organizations and their supply chains globally to achieve their strategic goals responsibly. Next slide, please. During times of major challenge and crisis, such as COVID-19, professionals responsible for occupational safety and health, which we call OSH, hold vital roles helping organizations and governments protect lives and manage OSH and wellbeing risks, business continuity and sustainability. They work throughout all sectors and for organizations of all sizes and types across the globe. And IOSH is actively supporting these efforts. The coronavirus pandemic with large scale illness, loss of life and human suffering is a public health crisis that tests the world's collective capacity to respond. Protecting people is the top priority and decision makers must show leadership now. IOSH believes it's essential to protect workers' physical and mental health, prevent exposure to COVID-19, monitor the disease and its spread, ensure access to the best treatment for any workers who become ill and provide wellbeing support for those who are quarantined. OSH professionals will also be instrumental in interpreting guidance and advising on returning to workplaces safely as and when that time comes. We're pleased to support this vital work by sharing resources with OSH professionals, employers and other stakeholders like you across the world. Workplaces everywhere can be effective focal points for guidance on preventing the spread of infectious diseases like COVID-19. IOSH provides access to key information and webinars every week on pandemic-related OSH and well-being 
and preventing virus exposure at work, coordinating with other leading international agencies, including the World Health Organization. Next slide, please. If we think for a moment about basic principles of occupational safety and health, our first focus must be on prevention. And everyone has a responsibility wherever they, are, they can to seek to prevent illness or harm. This of course requires good risk awareness, a risk intelligent approach. And the development of safety cultures that sponsor safe and healthy attitudes and behaviors amongst their workforces. This will lay the foundations that enable organizations to respond correctly if and when major incidents or threats like coronavirus occur. Four dimensions you should consider at a high level in a contagious disease outbreak like this are comprehensive planning, appropriate risk controls like excellent hygiene, physical distancing, personal protective equipment, uh, what we call PPE, mental health support, and so on. Ensuring these are provided and used correctly too, where necessary. Third, staff must be well trained and able to work safely and effectively. Uh, and then fourth, to review, to check that everything is working as intended and address any problems that you might identify. When carrying out risk assessments and deciding on control measures, OSH professionals are conscious of something called the hierarchy of controls. You can see that here on the right side, uh, right side of the screen. Elimination of the risk is the most desirable control, of course, and limiting exposure via personal protective equipment, PPE, is at the bottom of this inverted pyramid. In simple words, PPE is a last line of resort. Of course, as we know with COVID-19, PPE and respiratory protective equipment, RPE, remain essential controls. Even though all steps will be taken to eliminate hazards, design at risk or manage situations to make them safer. PPE must be done right though. Correctly choosing the right gloves, gowns, aprons, eye protection and face masks. Correctly donning and doffing of these face masks, doing face fit testing, etc. For example, FFP3 respirators for aerosols if we're likely to be exposed. And staff need to be trained in their proper use and also their proper disposal too. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges for key workers? Well, key workers such as those in healthcare or farmers, journalists, grocery store staff and fire services or other essential services are finding themselves working in extraordinary situations right now. HR and OSH professionals will of course be alert to these circumstances and have a clear understanding of that extra support of an operational and logistical nature that might be required. In terms of operational issues, staff might be required to manage new or different tasks which may be unfamiliar. Expect then a level of disorientation or the need for time to adapt and learn. This might be the case, especially when the business is operating with fewer staff, either because of the illness, self-isolation or being placed on furlough. In terms of logistical issues, there'll be a heightened awareness amongst workers of the need to observe social or physical distancing recommendations, even though work pressure may tend to undermine this. HR and OSH professionals will be keen to ensure that social distancing is maintained in order to minimize the risk of infection. This may require modifications to the physical workplace, for example, taking steps to limit the number of workers occupying the same work area or limit the movement between one work area and the next. There are health and safety dimensions to redesigning workspaces too. Under intense public scrutiny at the moment, the provision of correct PPE is of immense importance to key workers, particularly those in front line of healthcare provision. To do their work effectively and safely, key workers need to be backed up by a functioning and reliable supply chain for equipment and personal protective equipment particularly, together with clear instructions on how to use them correctly. As I mentioned previously, OSH professionals would in normal circumstances place PPE as the last in that hierarchy of control measures. But in these times which are far from normal, PPE has now become one of the main challenges faced by key workers. Think back to that triangle on the previous slide that I shared with you. Organizations need to seek to avoid the need for PPE through engineering and administrative controls. This should be a first step. And that includes thinking about things like barriers or screens, having people work from home and physical distancing, hygiene measures, and so on. They should also make themselves aware of any local or central government support for accessing PPE and make use of that for key workers. Next slide, please. In terms of management factors, in addition to the operational and logistical issues, key worker situations can be exacerbated by remote or absent leadership. At times like these, when workers are under enormous strain, 
clear, visible and decisive leadership is paramount. Lack of contact may signify lack of care or interest in their situation or create doubts about the ability of managers to take responsibility for dealing with the challenges faced. Among the many management challenges that this highly charged situation poses, there'll be a demand for managers to lead in ways which are out of the ordinary to them. There are many important things for managers to communicate to their employees. Nevertheless, a balance needs to be struck, doesn't it, to avoid communication overload, which may consume valuable time and be stressful. In all of this, HR professionals and OSH professionals will be acutely aware that there's a need to focus on employees' mental health and well-being, as the previous speaker mentioned. Perhaps, unlike everyone else at the moment, key workers may not be facing concerns about job security. Nevertheless, they or members of their family may be concerned about future financial security. And all the while, they're attending work in what may be a very stressful environment with exposure to risk of infection. Healthcare workers may also be facing on a daily basis, traumatic situations in dealing with severe illness and death. HR professionals in the healthcare sector will be conversant with the kinds of mental health issues that their workforce faces. But the pandemic has intensified the likelihood of these developing into serious or chronic conditions now. In addition to sudden changes in behavior, OSH and HR professionals will need to be aware that workers may fear going to work or even experience feelings of guilt if they stay off work. The anxiety or fear of losing their jobs may compel workers to attend work even when they're not well, physically or mentally. And there may be a tendency to under-report sickness too. To the next slide, please. HR and OSH professionals have got different disciplines, approaches and methods, of course, and professional bodies too. But it's clear that we've got a shared agenda of empowering people to work effectively, productively, healthily and safely. The coronavirus pandemic has brought this into focus and we can now work together to ensure that we support managers, employees and make the necessary reasonable adjustments to working environments at this time. Next slide, please. Well, I guess it's sometimes useful in presentations to horizon scan and try to envisage the future. And I've been asked to speculate how the future landscape of health and safety might shape up. I don't have any fixed ideas on this, although I'm certain that the health and safety profession has a vitally important role to play if we're to have workplaces that are safe, healthy and sustainable. And by that, I don't just mean the interests of business in countries in the UK. If nothing else, what this pandemic has shown us is the interconnectedness of people around the world. It's demonstrated how interlinked our fortunes, economic, industrial, social and environmental, really are. In answering the question on the effect of the pandemic on workplace safety and health, then I hope you don't mind, I've responded by thinking out loud a set of questions for myself and I share them with you here. Whether you're a health and safety professional or an HR professional or neither, in these questions, I try to consider things from the point of view of workers and organizations, of OSH professionals for whom, of course, I have a particular interest, but also of the wider public and the policy arena. So in closing on the next slide, please. There will come a time when we'll be able to return to work. Though return may actually be the wrong word, as it assumes we'll all be going back to something that we're already familiar with. I believe that it won't be like that. If we conclude from answering the questions posed in the previous slide, that the working environment will have changed permanently, then we need to think about what the new normal might look like for us. Yes, we can talk about phased returns to the office or plant, and balancing that against the need to get back up to full capacity as soon as possible. But as HR and OSH professionals, we have a role to play. In fact, a duty in preparing the ground for that to happen. Immediately, uh, and most in our control, is what we must do to make our workplaces safe places to return to, wherever they are, and to keep them safe. Second, I think we must rethink our working practices. How do we modify, redesign and remodel our workplaces and processes so we have a work environment that's sustainable and more resilient in the future to shocks like coronavirus? There are many questions here about management styles and methods, about culture, about communication and about what's important. Our people, my third point, how do we ensure we fit into the new working environment, whatever that turns out to be? What kind of leadership can we expect from managers in encouraging behavioural change? How do we re-educate ourselves about work and its role in our lives? And about the part of our lives that's so subsumed by work? 
I hope that we've learned something in this period about how we organize work and how we treat our fellow workers. I know that our two professions want to make a lasting positive impact in that regard. And it's a delight to be able to partner with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was, that was brilliant. I'm going to hand over to Stuart now, who's going to, I think, be able to bring some of that to, to life contextually by talking about what's going on at Weetabix. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon, Katie. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am uh, here at the Weetabix office today. Um, I was saying to my co-presenters, I don't know how uh, proud or ashamed to be uh, in the office and not working at home. I can, I can reassure everyone I'm here for essential reasons today and not uh, just part of this uh, CIPD uh, webinar, which again, I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of. Um, and uh, just to get my justification in again, it is the first time I've uh, been into work since the um, uh, 17th of March when we uh, trialled our first working at home. Um, and many of us, most of us, have, have not been back into the uh, regular workplace since. Um, I've been asked to do a quick introduction to the organisation, Weetabix Food Company, uh, talk about the shape of the organisation, uh, talk about the impact of COVID-19, some practical steps, um, how we are looking at keeping workers engaged um, and addressing the increased anxiety that our employees have had over that time. Um, and I am shamelessly going to refer back to a couple of comments that uh, Rachel and Andrew have touched on because I think they're uh, very, very relevant. So uh, a very quick uh, advert into Weetabix, first of all. Um, I don't think the product needs much uh, introduction because it is the number one uh, cereal product in the market in the UK. Um, Weetabix Food Company is also the home to other brands such as Alpen, uh, Weetos and Readybreak and a, a number of other um, smaller Weetabix branded products that, that some of you may know of as well. Uh, we are predominantly in the UK, but we do have manufacturing uh, operations in uh, the USA, in Canada, in Kenya and South Africa. Um, and in addition to those uh, fully fledged businesses in those countries, we also have commercial and support operations in China, in Spain, in Germany and Middle East. We export to over 85 countries worldwide, again, predominantly from the UK. Uh, but from some of those uh, other countries, Kenya, South Africa, so on and so forth. Um, our route to market is uh, almost entirely through retailers. So um, the major multiple uh, supermarkets um, and other um, retailers as well. And uh, even our e-commerce business is predominantly traded through um, the online retailing of those uh, major multiple retailers and, uh, and the such like. Um, we have the significant majority of our business is, uh, is the branded products that I've mentioned. And again, uh, the significant majority of our business is, is UK based. As I say, the, the product doesn't need much introduction. Uh, we are still today in more than 50 uh, households worldwide. 76% of UK adults grew up eating breakfast. Um, and for some of you who may not know, we're now owned by Post Holdings, which is a, a US listed company. We have 2000 people uh, worldwide, um, about 1300 of those in the UK, of which, and drawing on today's subject, about 1000 of those are in manufacturing. Um, about 300 are in the commercial and support functions. And that's broadly my introduction to how COVID-19 has impacted. Um, just under a thousand people in the UK are continuing to come into work and work their shifts. Um, and uh, almost entirely the commercial and support functions have remained at home now for uh, what is now nearing the end of our um, fifth week of uh, that home working. We are very lucky. We have uh, good engagement scores. We have some brilliant employees. Um, and we have a uh, very long service and, and some brilliant loyalty. So how has uh, COVID-19 impacted us? Well, um, you know, the, the introduction to COVID-19 was the same for us as it was for everyone. Uh, rapid um, uh, growth of awareness around it, 
although I am, again, intrigued and ashamed to say that I was talking to my HR director in China about this in January, and uh, my forecasting of how this was going to um, go global was no better than anybody else's, so uh, hadn't been on the front foot around that perhaps as much as we could have been. Um, but as it took hold and as we uh, saw the uh, news break, um, our first and foremost uh, concern was around the health, safety and well-being of our employees. And I'm, I'm very proud to say that that's where we put a considerable effort to begin with. Secondly, it was uh, around being compliant um, and making sure that we knew what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Thirdly, it was around resource planning. So we have seen uh, in excess of uh, 30, 40 percent increase in demand for our brands and our products um, as uh, the uh, panic buying happened in the UK and indeed in some of our uh, European and uh, international markets as well. Um, so resource planning for the businesses uh, and ensuring our communication to our employees was as timely, as accurate as it possibly could be. And it's, it's shamelessly only after we've been feeling confident that we've been doing those things well have we started to think about um, recognition of our employees and about lessons learned and also uh, a bit of future forecasting, uh, the horizon scanning, as, uh, as Andrew mentioned. So um, we have uh, seen very high levels of absence uh, in our manufacturing staff that got up to... Um, just shy of 100 employees at, uh, at any one time um, and I'm very pleased to say that that's rapidly come down now to about uh, half of that. We, we're seeing absence levels at the moment of, of less than 50 uh, in total number. We did at the same time put out a branded advert for uh, agency workers and short-term uh, requirements for employees um, but we have managed that through our agency provider, which we had uh, good partnerships in place. So we put a branded advert out, um, but, but directed those people through the agency. One of the things that we did is we took a decision very early on to put in an additional 14 days of company sick pay. Uh, again, we're a, we're a fortunate business. We have some brilliant uh, legacy and history and uh, traditions in Weetabix, and we have good terms, good payment terms and good um, employment terms and we we are proud of the good levels of company sick pay that we have but in addition to the company sick pay we offered um, very quickly uh, 14 days of additional sick pay which were designed specifically for where employees needed to self-isolate um, not where they were showing symptoms but where family members people in their household needed to and we went further and said that those 14 days were also available for any employees when the government started taking decisions about closing schools. We knew that uh, our employees couldn't put childcare arrangements in quick enough to do that. Because we wanted accurate reporting of absence, um, we didn't think it was best to encourage or force our employees to uh, sign themselves off sick um, claiming that they had the symptoms where actually it was the other pressures. So as I say, one of the things that we did was uh, offer um, full pay to employees for up to 14 days uh, for other reasons other than taking time off uh, where they were ill or where they were showing absence. I'm also very pleased to say that our owners, our president of uh, uh, Post Holdings, put out a communication very quickly to say that uh, in times like this, we are going to be judged by our behaviour and our leadership, um, not by our financial results. So that gave um, us as an organisation and all of our sisterly companies an opportunity to think very uh, prog progressively about our leadership and our behaviours of what we need to put in place here. We are in a very, very, very fortunate position. We are not furloughing any staff at the moment. We are not having to... Um, uh, make choices about absence of leadership, which uh, uh, Rachel referred to. We are in a very, very fortunate position that even the um, remote workers, the, the employees working from home, have got all of the full line management and all of their colleagues around them. And, and I do uh, feel very fortunate. I do feel very lucky that we are in that position. 
um, versus uh, a number of my HR colleagues that I'm talking to via the, the CIPD and other forums. Uh, we have um, moved to risk assessment, which I mentioned to make sure that we were remaining compliant. And that's required us to go into every single one of our factory units um, and carry out um, uh, observed risk assessment, looking at where our employees are unable to socially distance, maintain that two meters apart um, from working. Uh, again, we're lucky, we're a food manufacturing environment, so we have had some very good food hygiene standards. We've had um, uh, the appropriate PPE equipment, um, sorry, PPE. We have had excellent standards of sanitation. We have some of our factories that have um, uh, environments that, that have nut processing. We have other factories that don't have nut processing. So the culture, the behavior of food and hygiene and uh, well-being is, is well practiced in our organization. So again, we're, we're very fortunate from that point of view. Um, and uh, again, like some of uh, the co-presenters today, I know have been involved in uh, well-being and mental health uh, webinars over the past days, hours. Um, we too have made sure that we are looking significantly at the health and well-being of our factory workers that are coming into work and are um, managing that tension between the news that they're seeing about um, people should be staying indoors, people should not be traveling without essential travel, but at the same time are also um, needing to come into work because they've been identified as key workers. And at the same time, thinking about these employees that are working from home. Um, again, we, we're lucky being in the Midlands and being in the location that we're at. Um, we don't have... Uh, an awful lot of our commercial and support functions that are in one bedroom flats in, in very confined spaces. But at the same time, we're very aware that they're trying to work from home with other pressures, um, children around them, some employees without anyone else in their household. So we are putting time and effort and investment into um, those areas of uh, well-being for those side of our employees. Um, I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to the questions and answers later on. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, and uh, last but not least, I'm going to hand over to Tracy and then we'll take questions. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm Tracy Leckhorn, I'm Chief HR and Health and Safety Officer at Sewers Recycling and Recovery UK, responsible for uh, HR, health and safety and facilities. Uh, we <coughs> uh, have been asked to to think about uh, how we've responded uh, in managing the COVID uh, situation. And so I'd like to share some insight um, and to draw uh, and to share with you um, some information around how we've drawn on our safety culture uh, and our commitment to wellness for all at sewers to help support our frontline workers, uh, indeed all our workforce uh, and sewers family in maintaining attention, uh, essential waste services um, during uh, these unprecedented times. Just move to the first slide. Thank you. Uh, so for those of people who aren't uh, too familiar with sewers, we're a, a recycling and recovery organisation we manage nearly 10 million tonnes of waste a year. Some of that we collect uh, ourselves uh, from people's homes, uh, but also from over 30,000 businesses across the UK. We also, for instance, operate household waste recycling centres. Um, at the moment, we've closed uh, ours uh, for safety uh, reasons, and we're looking at the moment of what we can put in place to ensure our staff safety in order to, to uh, move to opening some of those moving forward. We also have sites uh, that reprocess uh, materials, so things like plastic, glass, paper, um, and uh, you know, we draw those into material streams and you know, uh, sell those on the commodities uh, market to be recycled into to other goods. And then for materials that can't be recycled, Called, uh, we then uh, process those through our energy from waste sites uh, to create energy 
that is uh, sold then to the national grid. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to set the scene and a bit of a context around uh, how we've operated uh, during the coronavirus um, situation. So we have actually over 5,000 employees now. Um, we actually uh, operated and, and started a new contract during the uh, corona situation that welcomed over 400 new employees to sue us. We've about 4,000 uh, frontline uh, workforce, um, uh, then other operations staff, and over 500 support staff as well. During the pandemic, uh, we moved to have uh, 907 people working from home. Uh, that happened very quickly, as did, I think, for the rest of the country. We initiated that before the lockdown, so that was helpful for us. We've currently protecting 243 vulnerable members of staff, uh, so we are very prompt to uh, ask our pregnant ladies to go home, uh, our workforce who are over 70, and people with underlying um, conditions, and, and very proactive in that space. Um, at any one time, we've had up to 500 uh, members of the team self-isolating at home, but you know, as is the experience of uh, you know, uh, colleagues uh, uh, on this WebEx, that's very much uh, 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 smaller numbers now. I think as of today, it was 92 uh, members of staff self-isolating for those short-term 7, 14 days. We have uh, furloughed members of our workforce because in some areas, the work has just naturally um, reduced. For instance, collections from small businesses that are closed at the moment, restaurants, etc. They're not generating their waste. But obviously, there's more waste uh, being created at, at the households. Uh, and so we've been able to use our workforce agilely to help with that. And also, actually, our workforce have been very willing uh, to, to help our customers. Um, so to help our local government contracts uh, uh, organisations as well. Um, we've stood down some staff who we aren't, we aren't eligible to furlough. Uh, and as I say, we've, we've welcomed over 400 new employees to sue us during this period. So over 300 sites, we've got 115 uh, household waste recycling centres that and that's the area of our business that at the moment has been predominantly closed. Uh, the rest is fully operational. Um, when we're asked to talk about this WebEx, we're focusing on health and safety, well-being and engagement. Our leadership is absolutely vital and core to that. Obviously, there's a lot more to managing a business through this type of situation than those uh, three things. So no apology for not mentioning everything. I have focused on those three areas. Okay, if we could move to the next slide, please. Uh, so I've got quite a varied background uh, in HR. Uh, I've only been with sewers less than two years, absolutely brand new to the waste uh, industry. Uh, prior to that, I've worked uh, for PwC in consulting, but also 12 years of my life in the NHS for just about every type of NHS trust you can work for, acute uh, community settings, mental health, uh, and a primary care trust. Um, but a large period with the ambulance service. And uh, obviously in 2005, when the bird flu uh, first came along as a hint of uh, pandemic, lots of work was done by local government and the NHS in planning for pandemic and um, being in HR in the ambulance service at the time, you know, I was very heavily involved in managing our people plan associated with the pandemic. Um, so, you know, being in those closed rooms, looking at and modeling figures and the consequences uh, as would have occurred in ambulance services and beyond. Um, you know, I think, you know, for myself, it's been quite challenging in some ways, seeing, you know, some of that planning actually becoming a reality in front of my eyes uh, on the television. But also, it's been very helpful 
because I have, you know, a, a fair amount of experience in planning and thinking about and scenario planning situations um, that perhaps other experience or other HR experience wouldn't have given me. So uh, from the very beginning, uh, we've got a small board uh, at Suez UK, um, very, very uh, experienced uh, chief executive, um, business development and operations um, uh, members. And so, you know, as someone new to the industry, we could draw, uh, I could draw on their experience. And um, we put in place, again, um, drawing on uh, my emergency service experience, a structure, a management structure uh, based around gold, silver and bronze cells. The gold cell comprised of the board and some other key parties such as communications, uh, our legal, um, uh, my health, head of health and safety. Go, uh, silver cells were based on a regional basis and then bronze cells uh, with the aim of turning those on in parts of the business as they were needed. Uh, and I must admit that, you know, we set that up, um, you know, sort of prior to things really escalating. Perhaps like yourself at Weetabix, thinking, is this, is this really coming? Uh, we can see it, but are we in denial a little bit? Uh, but we had it in place and so could very quickly turn it on when the need arose. And as part of that, very much using social networking, um, um, media to have real-time communications because in management of those types of emergency situations you know really clear and decisive communication uh, not just one way not just two way but dynamic communication is what actually helps carry the situation and the business through we also put a lot of focus on proactively really looking at our business continuity plans and giving them a pandemic focus uh, and actually developing new skills in our managers, new capability around scenario planning uh, for uh, this uh, situation that I think will be something that will be really positive we take out of this uh, at the other side. I'm very keen to have honest and open communication and engagement with our people throughout. Okay, if we just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So with regards to uh, health and safety, and as Andrew uh, mentioned uh, himself, you know, the priority here has to be infection prevention uh, and then control of it in situations that arise. And that's the focus that we uh, took. At Sewers, we have uh, very much a safety culture. Safety is our absolute priority. Uh, we created our safety in mind charter well before my time of joining sewers so it's very much embedded in the way uh, that we work so we had real expertise really great knowledge um, in order to be able to actually use that and drive it towards actually management of this particular situation uh, absolutely keen with regards to that prevention that we're telling our staff you know how they can pre best you know, look after themselves with regards to good hygiene. And that's something that is in everybody's control. So really hammering home that message from the outset, really, really important. We're also very keen um, to, you know, draw on the knowledge and the guidance of Public Health England. We've used that to guide our decision making looking at NHS best practice that we can draw on with regards to infection. Uh, prevention and control. Uh, we created new procedures uh, around that uh, for sewers in our style so people would be comfortable and be able to operate uh, with those and then very much about manager and employee briefings um, ensuring we've got the right PPE in place uh, and, you know, obviously, like everyone else, the challenges of social distancing while also trying to get the job done. Okay, so that's health and safety. If we just move to the next slide, please. Uh, I think for me, well-being was absolutely vital in this situation, you know, from the absolute outset. 
I think it's really important that we acknowledge that we uh, are not robots. We are human beings. We are scared. We don't know what's happening around us. This is not just one area of our life being impacted. Often we can cope if it's impacting home or work and we can balance that out. This is impacting all aspects of everybody's life and we need to acknowledge that. So last year we'd created uh, our wellness charter uh, with a commitment and a philosophy of wellness for all. It was created by our people across the business in focus groups uh, and by our works council and our, our wellbeing groups. And it has within it eight domains. And for the pandemic, we were drawing really on four of those dom domains that we're looking really at that the psychological well-being, physical, financial, uh, and also looking at the work environment, whether it's about ensuring our people are safe and feel confident to come to work to do the job. And obviously those working at home, you know, how they were coping with that new way of working as well. So we've been partnering with um, Simon Richardson from Golden Tree, who we'd engaged on mental health training previously. And he's worked with our communications team and my lead for wellbeing at Sewers, Anthony Dursden, to create uh, some guidance on emotional uh, resilience. Uh, I don't want to get to a point where we're dealing with the impact of mental health issues on our people very much, you know, again, in line with, you know, managing the infection, let's be proactive and let's go for prevention, not needing all this cure later on. And I do think there will be longer term effects to this, you know, if we don't support our people in the best way that we can. So we created a, gu a guide um, and uh, Simon has created some, uh, a series of mental well-being videos. And also, we've just had, just immediately before this webinar, uh, a WebEx, uh, a live WebEx uh, around um, mindfulness uh, and meditation. Uh, and we'll be running those uh, every Friday uh, for the next few weeks. As well as support on uh, financial support and well-being, we've got some WebExes and some guidance as well coming along. And some new um, um, interventions that our staff will be able to access as well, such as advances on wages and access to loans that they might not have otherwise been able to. Because although at Sewers we are you know, very much keen to do the very best that we can by our people, um, and our people on furlough are, are on uh, full pay, that's our commitment at the moment, as, um, and we want that to, to be continuing if we can, we know that you know, their partners and loved ones and who they live with may not be in the same situation that our people are in. So keen to provide some support. And I think for frontline workers, it's always important you know, that actually you know, webinars might not necessarily work for them. So putting together information and toolbox talks so that we can access um, uh, everybody who might potentially need some support. So that's our wellness. Okay, if we just move forward, please. Hi, Tracy. Sorry, we've only got about five minutes left. So can okay. I ask that quite quickly and then we take a few questions. I will run over slightly because we've had quite a lot of questions. Thanks. Okay, sorry, no problem. If you just move to uh, uh, engagement, there's only uh, a couple of slides left. And then the third area uh, was around uh, engagement. Um, and, you know, as I was saying with regards to Sewer's culture, our guiding principles throughout the priorities are our people, our, then our customers, and then our business and the financial impact on that. And we are, you know, stuck very resolute to that. Around the engagement, Sewers is one of uh, the Times, uh, Sunday Times, 25 best big companies to work for. So again, like uh, was said a little earlier, we have fantastic levels of engagement, very committed people who have been prepared to work, you know, in different ways. Uh, who have been prepared to work in other areas of our business and indeed support our customers in providing services as well. And in order to, you know, sort of enhance and, and that engagement, we've been very clear about our communication and very honest about the situation that we're in. 
John, our chief executive, has done very regular emails and video uh, announcements to staff. We're using text messaging. We've got our own app, me.sewers, and also, you know, webinars uh, where people can ask uh, live questions uh, of, uh, of John and other board members. And so I think really it's about looking at holistically uh, during the um, management of this situation uh, and to be cognizant, uh, you know, at all times that our people need to know that the organisation is in a safe pair of hands, that's making the right decisions that are in their best interests. Uh, and that, you know, very importantly, knowing that we will come out of this situation. And if you just move to the left slide, you know, really, really important that our staff, our frontline uh, workers, you know, are well recognised and understand that we thank them for everything that they are doing to keep our business moving forward during this time, but, but also to help the national effort with regards to you know, providing essential waste services. And we've had some phenomenal response from the public thanking our uh, frontline workers for that. Okay. Thank you, okay. Tracy. That's so lovely to see. I really, that really, really quite heartwarming actually. Um, so I'm, I am gonna run over by no more than five minutes, I promise. Um, and obviously, if you have to leave early, you can access this on demand. But I just want to get through a few questions. Um, so we've had a couple about supporting or reassuring key workers who might feel disgruntled or undervalued when some people are either able to work at home or other people have been furloughed on full pay. Um, Stuart, can I ask you to offer some thoughts on that? Remember, everyone has to unmute themselves. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Um, yes, Katie, we uh, we have had some uh, examples of that. We've uh, had some employees that have kind of referenced the fact that it's okay for the commercial and support functions that are working at home, and they're the ones that are having to come into the office. I, I think largely um, it, it's genuine fears for people, and I think where we are able to... Uh, show them the work that we're doing around the risk assessment, showing what we're doing to keep them safe. Uh, I think that's their primary concern. Um, as I said earlier, we are thinking very actively, and, and it, it would be inappropriate for me to share it here first, but uh, we, we are about to make some announcements around, around what we're doing from a kind of recognition point of view. Um, so we, we are putting in place some um, uh, key uh, recognition for our employees in that regard but I, I think um, and I would say this as an HR director wouldn't I but um, those employees want more than anything reassurance they want communication they want to uh, feel appreciated so I think that's where um, it was said earlier about um, the role of leaders and really making sure that we as an HR function we as, a, as an executive team are supporting our uh, leaders right the way through the organization, particularly our frontline leaders that uh, are in situations that we've never been in before. So we, you know, it's unrealistic to expect them to be in it. But uh, we have had some of that, but we are dealing with it. And that we, we uh, similar to, as Tracy was saying there, we have got uh, 10 times the number of uh, employees that are telling us about how proud they are to work at Weedabix and what we are doing for them um, versus a few that ge genuinely have got concerns. Um, Probably just the one thing I would say on that is that in, in, certain in certain circumstances where we have got employees that are very anxious and very concerned, we are encouraging them to take time off where they can sign themselves off with anxiety. They can sign themselves off um, needing that time off through uh, stress and anxiety and, and concern. And, and where that's the case, we're encouraging them to do that. Thank you. Um, got a couple of questions I'll put to both Andrews, actually, if that's all right, about um, in considering safety, what's your view on how we can support pregnant colleagues and their health and safety? Can the risk truly be mitigated at all in a supermarket environment? Or would you recommend maternity suspension? Um, and somebody else asking about will pregnant employees be able to return to workplaces even when restrictions are lifted? So um, Andrew Sharman, do you want to take that first? Um, thank you. That's a, a pretty complex question. I'm not sure I have a full answer for it, but uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps start by tackling the second part of it. Uh, the, answer, uh, the, the answer to what happens when we return to work, quite simply right now, is we don't know. 
Um, we, we haven't had experience of coronavirus before. Yes, we have had other large scale disease, but nothing quite like this that stopped the entire planet in the way that this has. And we haven't had anything to go on in terms of our past learning. So we're in an evolutionary state, learning day by day by day at the moment as to what's happening with the virus and how we think about getting back to work. No doubt that uh, OSH professionals and HR professionals will need to work hand in hand as we think about transitioning people back from, from lockdown into work environments, whether they're pregnant workers or, or workers of any other kind with vulnerabilities or not. Uh, so, so I think a robust risk assessment is, is the first start point there and, and that to be conducted uh, together with, with OSH and HR professionals. Thank you. Um, Andrew Willis, is there any kind of legal angle on mitigating risk for pregnant women? Yeah, just worth, worth mentioning that um, the only mention of pregnancy on the shielding list uh, is a reference to pregnant uh, people with um, significant heart conditions. So there's no general sense in which uh, pregnant uh, women are uh, essentially more at risk other than in that category. As regards maternity suspension, um, it's a last resort. So in the, co in the context of the supermarket situation, you would perhaps look at redeploying. We talked earlier off, off, off screen about uh, the risks when you introduce customers, third parties into the mix. Um, if you can't protect somebody in that open environment, then think about redeploying. And only when you've considered other options would you consider maternity, maternity suspension as the final option if it was necessary. Thank you. Um, Tracy, somebody's asked about how you see the line of, uh, sorry, the role of line managers of key workers changing in future. Do you think there are any learnings from, um, from the current situation that you'll try and hang on to when it comes to line management? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we just started a project at Group, uh, a global project that has this as one of the work streams. And also, we've started, a, we put together a team uh, at Suez UK to think about actually what we want our future to be. We don't want to go back to the way that it was, phenomenal organisation that we are. We've had a lot of learning from this, and we want to draw on that, you know, to take us forward. I think, you know, we've been very fortunate at uh, Sewers. Everybody stepped up to the plate, been so keen to ensure that services are provided, very passionate about the environment and the welfare of society around their waste. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, we, we should spend time in the moment right now, capturing that learning, capturing the essence of how people are feeling not just wait and then reflect on it, capture that now and, and take that forward. And we're thinking, you know, with regards to, you know, what is the manager of the future? You know, what does that, that look like? Um, people's values and thoughts on life and their priorities will change because this is such a huge experience that's, that's happening to them. Thank you. I'm um, just going to take one more question, which has anybody got any ideas or can comment on the role of behavioural insight and behavioural economics influencing to support staff in adopting the right behaviours? So has anybody got any advice on creating good nudges? I don't know who wants to take Andrew. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, as a psychologist, this area interests me particularly. And I've, I've been pleased to see lots of, of, of nudges uh, being created throughout the coronavirus. If, if we think about what a nudge is, it's, it, it's something that gives us a conscious or subconscious nudge to do a specific behaviour that's required at that point in time. And, uh, maybe one that, that many of us will know is as we approach a pedestrian crossing, uh, often there's a change in the texture beneath our feet on, on the pavement. That's a, that's a nudge there. We've seen others coming up with coronavirus with, uh, with, with markings on the floor, lines indicating where two metres are between customers queuing, for example. Um, I, I'm currently stranded in the UK. I normally live in Switzerland. I'm in an Airbnb property in rural Scotland and, and in this village there's a pharmacy and they put a nudge on the door every day saying these are the things we don't have any stock of which, which creates the behavioral response of the customer not going in to, to look for those. I, I think the important thing about nudging is not just uh, creating the specific behavior but, but thinking about classical psychology and the importance of positive reinforcement. So if you, if you take Thursday nights at 8 o'clock in, in the UK as an example where we've been clapping for NHS and care workers. Uh, I noticed last night that's changed to pot banging now. Uh, and as I, as I was hanging out of the window, banging my pot with my wooden spoon last night, I felt this huge smile creeping over my face. Uh, and, and this idea of positively reinforcing the behaviors that you're looking to create 
is really key for us all as, as OSH practitioners and as HR professionals to think about if we really want to get these behaviours to stick, we should make them fun or reassuring. Mm. Carrot rather than stick. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring it to a close there because it's all we've got time to, for this afternoon. Um, thank you so much to our panel of experts for their time and their insight. I feel we crammed an awful lot of stuff in there and there were so many fantastic takeaways. Um, a reminder, this will be available to download um, and watch from this afternoon. So please do um, share it far and wide. To flag our next couple of webinars on Monday, we'll be looking at the importance of leadership and communication through crisis. Uh, next Friday, we're going to be exploring how HR teams can look after their own well-being because we know how hard all of you are working. Uh, a reminder to please keep using the CIPD Coronavirus Hub for resources, the CIPD community for support, and if you're a member, the HR Inform Helpline for individual responses to your toughest legal questions. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Have a good afternoon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Katie.